Hello, everyone. My name is Kai Garfield, and I am the director of the Kennedy Political Union, and I am delighted to welcome you all here today. I want to begin by thanking the numerous co-sponsors of tonight's event. So, thank you to the Kennedy Political Union, which has been serving the campus community since 1968, long before I have been involved with the organization, to provide relevant and impactful dialogue around current political issues, curating meaningful conversations like the one we'll have here today. Thank you to the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics, which fosters university-wide collaboration and is an incubator for policy innovation. Thank you to the School of Public Affairs, which is ranked top 10 in the nation and number one in DC for inspiring policy-related research and teaching for over 85 years. And thank you to the Colgate School of Business, which is globally recognized for their world-class programs, exemplary faculty, and successful graduates. Thank you. Oh. Thank, you. thank you. Finally, thank you all for making this event possible. I want to thank you all for attending our Peaceful Transition of Power event this evening. It's great to see so many people on campus supporting American University and attending these events because here at AU, we are all about community, conversations, and change making. In everything we do, it is to be an inclusive community of care that fosters change and has the dedication to see it through, making it so important that all of you, as family and friends, took the time out of family weekend to engage in the impactful dialogue that will be happening momentarily. Now, I am pleased to be able to introduce President Sylvia Burwell. Sylvia Burwell is AU's 15th president and the first woman to serve as president. <laughs> Under her leadership, American University became the first carbon neutral university in the United States and the first to launch an, oh, yes. Yes, we can clap for that and the first to launch an anti-racist research and policy center. <laughs> President Burwell has helped AU become a leading student-centered research university, more than doubling research funding from ex external organizations such as the National Science Foundation over the last five years, and helping to build a growing community of change makers who are bold leaders, engaged scholars, innovators, and active cit citizens. President Burwell led the creation of AU's comprehensive strategy, Change Makers for a Changing World, as well as our plan for inclusive excellence. Both of these efforts are rooted in community and are focused on ensuring that all AU students thrive and reach their full potential. She led the university through a historic pandemic, keeping the focus on our community of care. We knew it was special to have her as our president, someone who has served at the highest levels in Washington as Secretary of Health and Human Services and Director of the Office of Management and Budget. We could not have predicted how important those skills would be and how essential they were to our successful navigation of the past two years. President Burwell loves being on AU's campus, furthering her efforts of emphasizing our community of care. You will likely see her cheering on our AU Eagles athletics teams, getting students with her dog Zuzu on the quad, or joining in the dance -a -thon. Finally, President Sylvia Burwell is a definition of a change maker, and it is my pleasure to introduce her now to moderate tonight's discussion. Hi, um, I actually would just like to take a moment and thank you, uh, and also if we can also give Kai a, a hand. This is what our students are about. I'm so proud, Kai, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. 
and thanks to the KPU team. Actually, can we have a wave of hand? I see our KPU officers right there. Thank you all. We're so proud um, to be able to have an event like this that is co-sponsored with one of our student organizations. So thank you, KPU. Thank you, Kai. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's an exciting evening for us um, in terms of uh, the conversation we're about to have and one of the earliest conversations about the peaceful transfer of power. This is Dave's uh, new book, which we're excited to celebrate. I'm going to introduce our panelists. We're going to jump in, and then I'm going to save time at the end for questions from our audience um, so that we can hear from you all. And there will be mics that will uh, move around when we do that. And so as you're listening and that sort of thing, if you have things on your mind, please think about them. The first thing I want to do is just say that our three panelists tonight are a real testament to the talent, to the quality, to the integrity of public servants in our nation. And we are so fortunate to have all three of you all tonight. So thank you. And I, I think it's especially important because um, as a member of this university and as a leader in this university, you know, what we want to do is teach, encourage, and support our students to be able to do, to live, and to serve in the way that our panelists have tonight. So we're so excited, and I'm so excited to see both parents and I see a number of our students here tonight. So very excited about that. I want to introduce our panelists. John Podesta. I'm very fortunate because I've had the opportunity to work with all three uh, of our panelists. And so John, many of you may know, uh, John was the uh, chief of staff during President Clinton. He has maybe more senior involvement in transitions than just about anybody. Dick Cheney may give you a run for your money, but um, I think John uh, is right up there in terms of his experience. And whether that's chairing the Obama transition, um, the work that he did in terms of the Clinton transition, the work that he did, even though it wasn't used on transition for Hillary Clinton. Um, he's advised President Biden during his transition as well. Um, and so John is currently back in the administration right now, and he, his title is Senior Advisor in, on Clean Energy Innovation and Implementation. We are all lucky that John will be there as those large pieces of legislation are getting implemented in ways that will help and support our nation. So thrilled that John is back in. I will say that um, the last part of the introduction I will do is that John was my boss in 1988. Um, I worked on the, it was the opposition research team, uh, if you do remember John. Uh, and this is the 1988 campaign, and I worked for John Podesta. And just a fun fact in terms of the people who are here listening to this kind of conversation, the other person that worked with me for John Podesta, Elena Kagan. You may recognize that name. Uh, so, John, it is a pleasure. I uh, have known and worked with John for many, many, many years. And then John and I also shared, we were deputy chiefs of staff to the president together uh, and partnered on uh, much work then. So, John, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks. Josh Bolton. We're going to learn tonight, oversaw the gold standard of transitions. Uh, that's a part of what we'll discuss tonight. Um, Josh served uh, under two Bush presidencies uh, and was chief of staff in the second one for George W. Bush. Uh, when he served, he served at USTR. Josh and I also share, we were both directors of the Office of Management and Budget, a wonderful uh, and fabulous pet place. Uh, right now, Josh is uh, the head of the business sorry, roundtable. Business roundtable. Sorry about that, Josh. Uh, the business roundtable is where Josh is. That builds on his experience that he had at Goldman Sachs um, early on. And I have gotten to know Josh. You probably are gathering. Josh and I are from different parties. But Josh and I have had the opportunity to work together whenever one of us is in and one of us is out. And I will say, had the chance to work with Josh incredibly closely when we were working on issues like PEPFAR uh, in terms of that was President Bush's incredible effort on HIV AIDS uh, in the continent of Africa. And Josh was a vital part of that effort. And I'm going to tell you my quick story on that is um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where I was, you know, working on these issues. We were very engaged in these issues. There were meetings in Washington, D.C., and everybody was like, 
do you want to um, come because Bono wants to meet you know, with you because you're at the Gates Foundation running this kind of work? And I'm like, Bono's nice, but can I meet with Josh Bolton? <laughs> uh, in, in terms of that. And similarly, when I'm in, Josh is out, we've worked on so many issues together. Josh has been a, a great advisor and help in trying to make things happen in Washington, D.C. And finally, um, a member of our own community now for six weeks, uh, Dave Marchek is our new dean of the Kogod School of Business. We're so happy to have you, Dave. For 12 years, um, Dave uh, was a managing director at Carlisle here in Washington, uh, D.C. Dave and I served together uh, during the Clinton years. Dave has served in the current administration uh, for the Biden administration. And what led to this book that um, Dave has written was actually work that he was doing at the Partnership for Public Service, which plays a very important role in transition. So welcome to the three of you. Hope that gives you a sense of who we are here with tonight. So welcome. We're going to hop in. We're going to hop in here. So people here may or may not have spent a lot of time on the issue of transitions presidential transitions and why they're important. It probably came to your mind around January 6th and the incidents that occurred then. That may have raised the issue. But that is one part of transitions, and I hope that you all will speak to that and the answer to this question. But the question that I wanted to ask all three of you to get us started and get everybody level set is, why are presidential transitions so important? And I think you can talk about it from a January 6th, but then if you can talk about it from the perspective of the basic functioning of government. We're going to start with you, Dave, to set the table. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, being here. It's truly a privilege to be at American University. Um, it's family weekend, and my family's here, actually, my wife, uh, my parents. This is my first trip that my 88-year-old father has taken since COVID. And my mother-in-law is here, so that's the most important person to honor. Um, <laughs> And I want to give tribute to the three people with whom I'm on stage. They are three of the finest public servants of our era. Um, I counted, they, they've been in three cabinet positions, two chiefs of staff, and John has now been in charge of saving the climate, not once, but twice. So thank you for your service. Um, the handoff from one president to another <clears throat> is one of the most vulnerable periods for our country. It's a period where our adversaries seek to take advantage of the United States. And we know this actually from the transition where Josh was outgoing chief of staff and John was the incoming uh, transition chair for President Obama. And Josh actually um, should be in the transition hall of fame because President Bush had a shortened transition. It was only 35 days because of Bush v. Gore. Actually, John was managing the issue in the White House then. Uh, you recall that there was a dispute in Florida, 537 votes determined the outcome of the election in one state, which determined who had 270 electoral votes. And um, it was a period of great vulnerability. So President Bush, when he came into office, only had 35 days. A new president has to appoint 4,000 political appointees, 4,000. 1,250 of them need to be confirmed by the United States Senate. It's an impossible task. And so President Bush had a slow start. By the time of 100 days, he only had around 40 senior level officials in place. And eight months after President Bush took office, it was one of the worst days in American history when two planes hit the World Trade Center. The 9-11 Commission did an autopsy of what happened, and one of the things they found was that the shortened transition imperiled our national security because President Bush did not have the ability to get all of his senior people in place. And so that's why a smooth handover of power from one president to another is so important to our country. And the two of the folks on the stage have played perhaps the most important role in modern transitions of any other two individuals in the country. Josh, why is it important? Well, first of all, I, um, I'm, I 
feel really privileged to share the stage with uh, these three folks, each of whom I admire uh, greatly. And let, let me just say to the parents, uh, AU parents and students in the audience, how lucky are you to be at this great university with this president who has done such a fabulous job of um, taking advantage of the uniqueness of the Washington experience um, to give the, the kids who have a fabulous education. So, Sylvia, my hat's off. To you. Um, I'm, I'm a geek of, well, in many ways, um, but I'm a geek of presidential transitions. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative for the work that Dave has done to help publicize that and advance the cause of professional transitions. Um, I became a geek uh, of this particular subject, interestingly, on January 19th, uh, 1992, which was the last full day of the Bush 41 administration. And I was, uh, I mean, I wasn't a big cheese in the Bush 41 White House. I was a deputy assistant to the president. Um, but I had an office in the West Wing. I, I worked on legislative affairs, and I had an office in the West Wing. Mind you, it was the smallest office <laughs> in the West Wing. Uh, it, had act, it was actually, and this is true, a converted closet up on, the, up on the second floor, but it had a desk and a chair and a window. And, and the folks who know the White House know the office oh, I'm yeah. talking about. Um, and just being kind of a student of government and, and always a late worker, I, uh, I was among the last to leave my office on the night of January 19, 1992, the night before the inauguration. And I just decided to take one last tour around the whole West Wing, and I just went from place to place. And I, what I saw didn't surprise me, but it shocked me. There was nothing on the walls, there was nothing on the desks except a few computers and telephones. There was nothing on the bookshelves. There were a few workmen, you know, doing painting and hammering the different colored carpet that President Clinton wanted. Um, but the place was empty, and I thought if the American people or any of our adversaries could see that the, the locus and the focus of government at this moment is absolutely empty. Most of my colleagues had already turned in their badges and couldn't get back in through the White House gates even if they wanted to or were needed. So. Um, I thought, you know, what, a, what a vulnerable moment for our government. Um, imagine in each of your own offices, if every four or eight years, they took corporate headquarters and they just emptied it out. On, on the night of January 19th and afternoon on January 20th, a whole new set of people was going to come in that might not even know where their offices are, much less how to run the country at that moment. So I, I, I got a little nervous for the country. Um, I was also <laughs> uplifted by it because um, I thought, how, how great is this country that uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a government of men and women. It's, uh, it, is a, it is a democratic government where peacefully we can have a whole new set of people occupy this space and take over governance um, just overnight. And so I became a, I became a huge fan of, uh, of transition, um, and that, that helped lead to a lot of the work that we're going to talk about tonight. John, why is it important? 
Well, you could see we're kind of a mutual admiration society up here, so hopefully we'll, we'll get maybe a little more feisty. And, and, uh, but, um, and we didn't practice, but I want to pick up uh, from what Josh said, because I was the first person back into the White House at, right after noon on, on, uh, on January 20th in 1993. Three, sorry, yeah. not 1992. Yeah. The yeah. election was in 92, the transition was January of 93. I, and I was going in to serve as, in a role called Staff Secretary. Our friend and <laughs> colleague, Neera Tandon, serves President Biden in that role today. That's the person who managed all the, of the paper to and from the president. And back then it was on paper. Now a little bit more electronic, but it was all on paper. Uh, and one of my jobs, um, well, first of all, uh, to step back a, a stage. Uh, I wasn't planning to go to the White House. I got a call about a week out, uh, and, and they said, do you want to be the staff secretary in the White House? I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> one of uh, Josh's friends, uh, a guy named Jim Ciccone, agreed, who was uh, President Bush 41, H.W. Bush's staff secretary at the beginning, uh, agreed who was, you know, the Bush team wasn't expecting to lose. <laughs> so they're dealing with the fact that the person they admired, were inspired by, worked for, and loved is having to leave office. But he took the time, and he, he was taking his family out of town because he just didn't want to be here when Clinton was inaugurated. He took maybe three hours and walked me through what the job was, why its significance, etc. Anyways, long uh, story short, I'm the guy who is with the president when he takes his hand off the Bible, he goes to a room called the president's room off the Senate floor uh, in the Capitol and signed some executive orders, proclamations, nominations, for his cabinet, we rapidly moved our cabinet through the Senate confirmation process. And I've, you know, all of five minutes into the job, scoop up these papers, take them back to the White House. So I was actually literally the first person back in the White House. And the machinery of government had to roll on. There could be no pause. When you take your hand off the Bible, you, the president is in charge. And being prepared for that at the staff level, at the cabinet level, understanding what the security issues facing the country are, being read into the intelligence, being capable of acting at that moment uh, is uh, really uh, something that you really can't experience really in, the, in university and private sector, usually have a little bit of time to get in, to kind of work together for a while, to kind of uh, uh, think through what your strategy is going to be. That all has to happen before the president stands on the west front of the Capitol now. Used to be the east front, I think. Uh, and, takes the oath, and takes the oath of office. And uh, the codes are transferred. <laughs> the, you know, the nuclear football attaches to the new president. The security apparatus, apparatus of the country moves at that moment. At, Immediately. At uh, 12 o'clock on January 20th. And um, I, told this, I tell the story about getting that help from the outgoing Republican staff secretary, who he and I became friends over the years, because January 6th was such an aberration from what we had experienced up to that day. I think, uh, I at least read in, in David's book that Josh said we were very professional in handing off the White House uh, to Andy Card, and, and, and Josh was, came in as deputy chief of staff. Uh, in, nine, in, 2000, in 2001, when Clinton was handing it to Bush, 
Uh, they did an exceedingly great job in 2009 when Bush was handing it off to Obama. And I, I think it, it's just, you asked the question about January 6th. That was a break in history. It's, it's it probably really not, it, it, David writes in his book about uh, Hoover and, and Roosevelt, but really it's more akin to what happened uh, at the time Lincoln was trying to come to, to Washington, where there was an actual insurrection in the country. And, uh, you know, the trials are going on now uh, demonstrating that. And uh, that's bad for the country, bad for the world, and bad for our democracy. And we, we need to do what we can and come together in ways that we can that that never happens again. To make it real in terms of how the government has to go on. So John was the first person then. This is 1993, January 20, uh, 20th as we're, we're, we're coming in. We've all been to the inauguration. You wanted to watch it. And you get back to the White House, the parade, the president's coming down you know, and getting there, but you get in. We walk in, and uh, the National Economic Council did not exist. And we had a lot of help from Roger Porter, uh, who served uh, with Josh and happened to help me with my senior thesis. So it was great to have somebody on the inside who would help me with my senior thesis. He helped a lot uh, in terms of the transition. But we walk in, and it is as John describes, like, and Josh described on the way, what Josh described on the way out was like, you walk in, you go upstairs, went up to the second floor where the National Economic Council was gonna be, and there, uh, you know, there's nothing. nothing. And so, <laughs> but there was a White House fellow named Michael Froman, who then goes on to be my successor at the Treasury as Chief of Staff, becomes USTR, US Trade Representative. Michael is a White House fellow, and that's who transfers. The White House fellows are there. Michael, we walk in the door, I'm there, and Michael, I'm Bob Rubin's Chief of Staff, heading the National Economic Council. Michael comes in and hands me a memo and says, the President needs to decide within 48 hours on an issue with the GATT, which has to do with trade, the general agreements on trade and tariffs, and it is a banana issue that we are having with South America. So, like, you're like, what? <laughs> but, like, this is it. The president's got to decide. This is an international economic issue, and, like, you got to get on it. And some guy you don't even really know, but I did know him because Roger had helped me know him, hands me the memo. I mean, that is what's happening and what Josh describes in terms of the importance. The budget of the United States, a pretty important thing to keep the thing running. When we did the transition, the Clinton transition, actually we had people at the Office of Management and Budget going ahead and working for the other team. We had to shift people because that's the only way that that day when they get in the door, you know, this was when Gore lost. And that's what we needed to do, and you do it. So it's kind of getting to the understanding of, like, this is so important to the nation on the economic front, on the national security front, on every front. Dave, you talked a little bit about the gold standard. I want to actually ask you, and it goes a little bit, I think, back to, uh, John, a point you were making. Uh, what was the worst transition in history in the book? You spent time, the book is historical, it goes all the way back to Buchanan, uh, to Lincoln. What was the worst and why in terms of your book? Okay, so if you like history, if you like government, and if you like management, this issue is a bonanza. It's just pure fun. So the worst transition in history was Buchanan to Lincoln. It was four months at that point. That was before the inauguration was moved from March 5th to January 20th. Um, President, Link, President elect Lincoln was elected. Or, uh, within a few weeks, seven states seceded. The Buchanan government was paralyzed. Half of the government sympathized with the South. They were sending arms and money to the South. The Congress was dysfunctional. And that was a point when Lincoln was in Springfield, Illinois, and there was no communications. And so you basically had the country literally falling apart during the interregnum. Um, Lincoln, we talk about in the book, I interviewed a fellow named Ted Widmer, who wrote this wonderful book called Lincoln on the Verge, and basically talks about the train trip he took from Springfield, Illinois, 13 days to Washington, D.C., where he found his voice. 
where he transitioned, where he grew a beard, and he started to find the themes that became part of the Lincoln presidency about un the union, about coming together, and the country, essentially, the northern part at least, came together under President Lincoln. He only won 39% of the vote. And so that was the worst transition in history. The bigger question is, what's the second worst transition in history? <laughs> so this is an issue that I actually debated with Josh and John and Ken Burns, the wonderful historian and, and um, documentarian. It used, it, I think the consensus was it was Hoover to Roosevelt. That was at a time of the Great Depression. Uh, we had bank runs in 25 states. Hitler came to power, the Reichstag burned. Uh, all during the interregnum, and Hoover would not cooperate with Roosevelt. He thought Roosevelt was a feeble body and feeble mind, and there was no cooperation. Actually, after January 6, I asked Ken Burns what was the second worst, and he said this one. Because in the 233 years since George Washington handed the reins to John Adams, no shots were fired, no troops were alerted, no one died. And that's the miracle of the United States until January 6th. So I think historians will debate it. Was it Hoover to Roosevelt or Trump to Biden? But this was a bad transition. Josh, you had the opportunity, and Dave too, to work a little bit on with the Trump transition, the, the, the Trump to Biden transition. Uh, as you all think about that, there were, it sounds like there were places of cooperation. Um, in the context of that, and do you want to speak about what you thought were the challenges uh, and the things that went right, Josh, uh, in terms of that? Because it sounds like there were some elements. Well, I'll, I'll invite Dave to speak more about it, but um, one of the, there, there, there were heroes of, of that period within the Trump administration who were doing their best to do their job. And Dave, uh, Dave's book, um, which is available on Amazon for only... <laughs> How much? I'm not sure, but the proceeds go to the Partnership for Public Service, so. <laughs> okay. But it is available on Amazon, Marchick, M-A-R-C-H-I-C-K. <laughs> Doesn't say uh, with an excellent forward by Ken Burns, who, who Dave just referenced. Uh, but Dave's book does a good uh, example of calling out one of the heroes mm -hmm. of that transition, yeah. who was a fellow named Chris Liddell, whom I had first met when he was the chief operating officer of the Romney transition. Now, you've never heard of the Romney transition because Romney did not win. But somebody had, uh, but two, two folks, Governor Mike, former Governor Mike Levitt and this uh, New Zealander named Chris Liddell, who'd been at senior corporate levels um, in America for a number of years, they put together a fabulous transition. That's where I had first met this fellow named Chris Liddell. And somehow, he ended up as deputy chief of staff in the Trump White House. Um, and throughout this, and he remained as deputy chief of staff through the end of the administration. And he was the deputy chief of staff charged with the transition. And he was able to do quite a lot because he kept a low profile and made sure that the Oval Office was never alerted to what he was doing, both before the election and after, especially after, to try to make sure it was a responsible professional position that the country needed. And uh, Dave will remember well, on, on the evening of January 6, um, we were both in touch with Liddell. Uh, who was, who was performing his magic very quietly uh, to create pockets of cooperation between the outgoing Trump administration and the incoming Biden administration. And on, uh, on January 6, Dave, I don't know if you spoke with Chris by phone, but I spoke with him by phone. Uh, and this very tough grown man was in tears about what had happened in the country on that day, and he 
he was on the ledge and uh, had had so many difficult moments acting with integrity in his job over the preceding months, but uh, this, this was too much for him. And he was in tears, uh, ready to resign. Um, I, I did my best to encourage him, Dave, as I think you did as well. You need to stay at your post. Other, you know, the Secretary of Transportation can resign without, she did, without causing a grave risk to the country. I said, if you leave now, 14 days left in this government, who's going to who's going to try to take care that um, uh, that the Biden administration is not sabotaged, or or even that um, uh, the Trump White House leaves when it should? So, I, I really commend Dave's book for calling out one of the, uh, one of the pretty well unsung heroes of the. Uh, Trump to Biden. Josh, and thank Chris you. Chris Liddell, and if you, if you ever see him, thank him, because he <laughs> yeah. stayed. Um, just giving everybody a warning. Uh, John, I want to turn to you on, uh, on a question, but then we're going to turn to um, uh, folks here. And please have your question. If you don't mind introducing yourself, um, that would be terrific, and letting us know uh, uh, your affiliation with uh, AU, friend, parent, uh, whatever it is, we'd love to hear that, um, and we'll do those questions. But John, I, I want to take us to uh, the 60,000 foot, not even the 30,000 foot. We've been talking about transitions and the importance of transitions to the health of the democracy, but I want to take us all the way up to this question of the health of the democracy. And I want to ask you, John, um, if there is one thing that we need to do as a nation uh, in terms of the health of the democracy, and I should uh, be honest and open and say, to me, this is the biggest threat, because I don't believe we can handle sustainability. I don't believe we can handle all the important issues that we have as a nation, both our national security as well as domestic issues, without the health of the democracy being the underpinning of that. So I should say I have a, a, a bias about the importance of this particular question. John, if you were going to say there's one thing we need to do, um, what would you help our community know that you think is important, that we all know and that we all do? Or even if it's something that our community can't do, that others need to do, that they support it, uh, in terms of it, even if it's action that they can't take. Is there something that you think we should be doing to really uh, help the health of the democracy? Well, I think in the, in the current context, uh, clearing up the law around uh, the, the actual counting of presidential electoral votes through the Electoral Count Act, is kind of a front and center must do item. But I, I think the most important thing is to protect the right to vote. Uh, and to do, to, to remember, I had the good fortune of working with John Lewis when I was a young man. Uh, we worked together in the Carter administration before he had run for office. When you think of the blood spilled to earn that right to vote and the struggle that people went through, uh, to see the undermining of that is, is really, I think, another sad chapter that we've w witnessed in the last couple of years. But I think that there are Republicans and Democrats who believe that the franchise is critical and that everyone has the right to cast a vote and the Democratic underpinning, the legitimacy of the government is built around that. And, and that, so that will be my top. You know, and then there's ways to, to enhance the ability to vote, but that's protecting terrific. the right to and, vote and, is the uh, most important. Uh, thank you, and I think we can all think about what that means uh, to us and what we can do uh, on that issue. So, John, thank you, and John, also thank you. John had agreed to do this before he went in the administration, and one of the things, generally, when you go in, you, you, you don't continue with a bunch of your commitments and that sort of thing. But John, you're great. I'm here in my personal capacity. He is here in his personal <laughs> capacity and as a personal friend it's of a, many, many, many years. So, John, usually, thank you. Uh, yes, he is here in his personal capacity. So, want to hear your all's questions? Okay, I think we have mics. Is this true? I see a mic and I see a hand and a gentleman right here. Uh, you want to come on down and we'll get you a mic. 
and then I see another question over there for the next one on uh, and that. But let's do this one first, right here. And then so we're queued up and ready. We got Hi. another one over there. Uh, Claude Simon, I'm a parent. American University. All of you have been embroiled in I can't transition. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, a little closer, and I think we Sorry. Can. Claude Simon, I'm a parent. And I see that all of you have been steeped in transitions over the years. And you've also been speaking about vulnerability of transition. And I have yet to detect anything specific in what you're saying about transition. And the question is, when you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning with cold sweats about transition, is there anything in your mind that the United States law or government, the most vulnerable section, most vulnerable part of the transition. What is there that scares you? Are we in danger of coup d'etat at that moment? What scares us the most uh, in terms of transition, uh, in terms of vulnerability? What, what's the thing that you think is the, the biggest vulnerability that we have? Let me tee up something for Josh Bolton. Um, so Josh, as I said, should be in the Transition Hall of Fame because he set in, in process a series of procedures, um, organi organized the government, required briefing materials for the outgoing Bush administration and the incoming Obama administration of which John led the effort. One of the other things he did was he did a tabletop exercise for national security um, where he, he got the outgoing national security team from the Bush administration to meet with the incoming national security team for the Obama administration. Probably know what I'm teeing up. So that got some muscle memory together and it allowed the outgoing and the incoming to work at this delicate time, this vulnerable time in history. On January 20th of 2009 when President Obama, when President Bush was meeting with President-elect Obama before he took the oath of office, something happened, which Josh will tell you about. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, first of all, to set the scene on on the morning of, of Jan January 20th of Inauguration Day, the outgoing president hosts a, a tea for the incoming president and vice president, families, and it's, a, it's actually kind of a sweet, warm event in most, most years, not in, not in everyone. Uh, and before the outgoing president and the president-elect ride up in their limo to the Capitol for the, for the swearing in. Um, so present at the one that President Bush hosted for the Obama team was my successor as Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel. Uh, well, we can tell stories about Rahm for quite some time, but... <laughs> I won't, I won't get diverted by that, but uh, early in the morning of January 20th, in fact, on the night, January 19th, I was surprised by our intelligence fish, officials that there uh, was a credible, they had picked up credible information of a threat, a terrorist attack all for during the inauguration, which is... So that's a pretty dangerous time with all those people collected there and all the officials collected on the podium at the Capitol. So it was something that had to be taken very seriously. Um, so I mingled for a couple of minutes at the, at the tea. Then I grabbed Rom and I walked him downstairs through the, through the tunnel beneath underneath the White House uh, over to the Situation Room, which is in the West Wing, which is the National Security Center of the White House, um, where uh, 
several of the outgoing officials of the national security team were sitting around the table or on the screen with several of the incoming officials, specialists in homeland security, and we were connected by video link to a remote location where uh, we had sent the outgoing Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, and the incoming Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. They were in an, at an off-site location precisely for, for this kind of thing. And uh, we had a seamless conversation about the planning that needed to be done what the intelligence was showing, uh, did we need to pull the plug on the whole uh, on the whole event? That was done collaboratively between the two sides, because up until 11:59, the Bush people were in charge. Actually, 11:59 and 59 seconds, and at the stroke of noon, the Bush people had no authority, and the Obama people had to be in charge. Um, Thankfully, the uh, the threat turned out not to not to materialize, but it um, but it was a really good example of the kind of integration that needs to happen. And to the gentleman's question, that uh, it uh, I, I never would have thought that we would have to worry about a coup d'état um, during the transition. But I've always worried about the vulnerability to our enemies, who you know they know our calendar as well as we do. Um, and they know that what a moment of vulnerability that is for the country and one in which um, in, in all future transitions, we need to be especially alert. Okay. Why don't we go to the next question? Gentleman over here. Okay. We're getting a mic over there. Thank you. My name is Henry Rodriguez, proud parent of an AU junior in the School of Public Affairs and currently a White House intern. Uh, I read the book by Michael Lewis, The Fifth Risk, which focused on the transition uh, from the Obama-Trump administration on commerce, energy, and agriculture. I was very troubled after I finished the book. So could you comment on what the impact was during that transition, and is there still a lingering impact as to what happened after all that played out? Do you know the reference? Sure. So um, Michael Lewis, the great author of Moneyball um, and Liar's Poker, wrote a book called The Fifth Risk, which was about uh, the fifth risk. So the he asked the head of the uh, Energy Department's risk assessment team, the person in charge of nuclear weapons, you know, what are the biggest risks you see? And uh, I think the list was an errant nuclear weapon, North Korea, Iran, um, the climate, and then project management. And he said, project management. So Michael Lewis is a brilliant storyteller, and he told this story. And essentially, the story is that the outgoing um, Obama administration, Sylvia did this when she was at um, HHS. Basically, the outgoing chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, said, I'm going to do what Josh did and build on that. And he had the entire government prepare memos, briefing materials, etc. A good data point of that is on the transition that John led, the Obama transition in, the day after the election, 30 people that John hired, 30, the day after the election went to the Energy Department to start the transition planning for the Department of Energy. 30. The day after the Trump administration, the Obama team was ready to receive them. Sylvia was ready to receive your successor. And nobody showed up for 30 days. 30 days. So Chris Christie actually, um, I understand there's some students from New Jersey at AU, maybe. Um, he was the head of the transition for Trump pre-election and actually did a good job and then was fired two days after the election. And there was total chaos. And so I interviewed Chris Christie for the book 
and I said the same question you had, what's the impact of the fact that all your work was thrown out? And he said Trump never recovered. They never recovered. They never got their government organized. And uh, it hurt the effectiveness of the United States government in a way that undermined the good work of John Podesta, Josh Bolden, and others, and Sylvia. I want to see your, oh, go can ahead, John. I, can I, Jump uh, in, and then I'm looking for a student. Got one right there. OK. But, um, but just to add one point, I think the, uh, we haven't really talked about the Biden side of Trump to Biden. <laughs> uh, and both Dave and I gave advice, but were, had no formal role uh, with the transition. But I think given this question of the ability to, uh, the uncertainty of how they would be received if they won, project management, would there be cooperation? Uh, the, the Biden team started extremely early. They, uh, they in, in the spring of, uh, of 2020, and they built a system in which they sort of dual tracked with cooperation that is required by law, but also they had to build systems, including budget systems, computer systems, et cetera, with the understanding that that cooperation might not be forthcoming. And one of the other innovations I think they had, and, and again, Dave talks about this in his book a little bit, is they knew that they had the potential to have a hard slog on the Hill getting their people confirmed. They created a separate track to put people into government who did not require Senate confirmation uh, and created a sort of two whole personnel systems, one for people who needed Senate conf confirmation and one for people who didn't. And they were extremely successful in getting going, notwithstanding the, uh, the fact that, uh, at least at some agencies, there was massive resistance to even letting the transition personnel required by law into the building. And I think that I remember a, a call that three of us were on with Ted Kaufman and others early, and Ted was talking about this, and I don't think we thought that was such a good idea because we were thinking about the normal transition, but they actually anticipated all the problems that they yeah. faced. Uh, I think we, uh, one of our students in red right here. And I think this may be our last question. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hi, I'm Dante Arminio. I'm a freshman um, in the School of Public Affairs. Uh, my question to all of you, thank you. <laughs> my question to all of you is, at what point do you believe our democracy was at its most vulnerable? Because we see a lot of sensational titles in the news nowadays, our democracy is under attack. When do you, at what point in American history do you find we were at its most vulnerable? I, you know, look, I think we just lived it. <laughs> the, yeah. the most vulnerable moment mm -hmm. is, uh, can you imagine what would happen if the uh, people believed the legitimate winner of the election was denied coming into office? That, I don't know how close that came, but <laughs> it, uh, there are, the New York Times just did a, uh, a uh, review of the people running for Congress, and I think more than half of the Republican candidates for Congress deny the legitimacy of the Biden victory, where there is, uh, and whether, you know, if you just look at the facts, there is zero evidence of that. So I would answer your question, we'll come to Josh and Dave, I would answer that question, we are living it. That's why it's such a concern from my perspective. In terms of what underpins the democracy, I, I would take John's point and I'll, I'll see you and raise you, okay. John. Um, and the idea of legitimacy of elections and the legitimacy of that process, which is how a representative democracy has to function. That is being questioned 
even today, and those were the statistics. The second thing that you gotta have, and like, for those of you in SPA, you know, you're reading Alexis de Tocqueville, you are reading all of these things. Information, knowledge, and fact are the other part that are the underpinning, which is being deeply undermined as well. And so that's why for me, right now, is a point where we need to pay attention because the, the thing about this is, you know, uh, who said, you know, the best form, of, you know, it's a democracy if you can keep it. And I think we have all become, um, you know, th this idea that it's just a given, that it is this way. It is not just a given. And I believe we need to be alert and we need to be, which is why I asked the 60,000 foot question. Josh, what's your answer? Um, my answer is I, I can't improve on what President Burwell just said in her own house. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you can always improve in our own house. That's another part is the learning and changing in a democracy and an institution of education. Dave. I have nothing to add to President Burwell's comments. <laughs> Frank. Um, as you can see, all right, we are at 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to ask you all if you have a last word, any of you, but before I do that, I want to say thank you to everybody that's here tonight and participating. Thank you for your engagement uh, with us as a university and being here tonight. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. And I'm going to ask for a last word. Dave. A personal story to thank all the parents for Family Weekend. My wife Pam and I were up at our freshman's uh, family weekend last weekend. We went to dinner Friday night. We hung out on campus Saturday. We took him shopping for a warm jacket because he lives in Maine. Then he said, I'm leaving. I'm done. I was looking forward to family weekend, but I didn't realize there would be this much family. <laughs> and Pam and I looked at each other and we said, are we happy? And we were happy because the school was doing a great job. And this school does a great job for your students. Josh. Um, Sylvia, I just want to say thanks to you um, for being such a great partner over so many years. It's the, it's the lone Republican on the stage. <laughs> and, it, and it does feel lonely sometimes, <laughs> especially on a campus. <laughs> um, I want to. I want to thank you. I want to thank John Podesta, Dave Marchick, um, for such uh, such collaborators and friends for caring about an issue that I think is really important to our country. Congratulations, Dave, on a on a book that I hope raise the prominence of this issue all over the country. Thank you, John. John. So I'm going to answer the question I usually get when I come to campuses, was, is the West Wing real? <laughs> <laughs> and the show started at the end of Clinton. We became friends with everybody. I became particularly good friends with John Spencer, who passed away, Leo McGarry on the West Wing. And I, my answer to that question is, it's the only example in uh, sort of uh, television, movies, et cetera, where the people in the show are not cynical. And my experience is that the one administration accepted is that the people who work, Republicans and Democrats, for the president believe that what they are trying to do is in the best interest of the people. They're not cynical. They're working their butts off to try to improve the lives of the American and that's true of Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. And uh, so I leave it with that. Watch I, the West Wing if you haven't seen it. <laughs> you haven't seen it. You're too young. Uh, John, Josh, Dave, thank you all very, very much. Uh, Thanks, Sylvia. And I hope that all of our students um, leave with, uh, and the parents too, in terms of what John just said. It is, I think we would all just say hear, hear to that experience, which is why as I said, have worked with Josh Bolton every way, in, out, up, down, every way, because that is the kind of commitment that Josh, John, Dave, and hundreds of others, that you're going to be, the students here, you all are going to be us. You're going to be the people that serve. You all are going to be the people that make a difference. 
uh, and solve some of the challenging problems that we have. So thanks, everybody, and have a good rest of your evening. All right. Ciao.